everybody said Amen. I welcome everyone back from the August retreat in Jesus name I pray that everything we learned everything we prayed about everything we received will be permanent in our lives in Jesus name I will do the work of God with a new strength a new vision a new focus, a new commitment and consecration in Jesus' name. And I pray that the Lord will give us continual, progressive understanding of His Word so that we will not remain stagnant as where we were in the past, we'll be moving forward every time in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for this hour. Thank you, Lord, for this time. We're asking, Lord, once again, send your Holy Spirit to everyone afresh, anew, so that the revelation of your word will move us forward and will make progress in every area of the ministry in Jesus' name. Give us understanding. And by that understanding, help us to do your work profitably, acceptably, rewardably in Jesus' name. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Tonight we're coming to Galatians chapter 5. We're starting from verse 13. Galatians chapter 5. Verse 13, for brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not your liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Tonight the message is the full service of love to his body. The full service of love to his body. Look at that verse 13. It says, Brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. You know there are people when they read one verse of scripture, they fly with that. I'm called unto liberty. But well, Paul the apostle said, Follow me as I follow Christ. And he said, Though I be free from all men, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19. Though I be free from all men, yet I make myself a servant to all, that I might save some. He's telling us there's a balance between the liberty and the sacrifice of love that you make yourself to go through. Free from all men. Yet I make myself personally a servant to all. And it is to serve all that I might save some by love, serve one another. And then we come to Romans chapter 12. In Romans chapter 12, we're looking at verse 4. It says, for as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. In verse 5, it says, So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and everyone members one of another. Again, we're looking at the church here, and the church has been called by many titles and many names, but is choosing the image and the emblem of the body at this time. And there is a way the church is similar to the body. And it says, members of the body, like we have members in a physical body, we do not have the same office. We have the heart, it has its own function, office. We have the lungs, they have their own function, their office, we have the kidneys, they have a different office, and they have their own function. 
and we have the livers and they have their own function the intestines are there and they have their own function then you come to the visible walls the eyes the mouth the ear the hands the feet all have their different functions that's why it says we're members of the body but we do not have the same function but now we need to understand the other side of the story as the church is like to the body and the hands only have one function of his the feet only have one function of his and the eyes only have one function one of his so come back to the body the members of the body are like that and they are not like that what does that mean as you look at Paul the apostle he was an apostle one function he was a prophet another function he was an evangelist is gone everywhere from Jerusalem to Illyricum preaching the word of God with signs and wonders he was a pastor if I'm not a father to the others he said to the Corinthians I might not a father unto you and he was a teacher a teacher of the word of God are all apostles not but no but Paul was are all teachers no but Paul was are all workers of miracles no but Paul was do you all render help? No, but Paul did. Do they all have government setting things in order in the church? Not everybody, but, but Paul was. As you look at the body, yes, every member has just one function. That's one side. The other side is that a member of the church, a minister of the church, depending upon his calling can have different offices all together balanced together and they're serving the lord with all that god has given them that's why jesus himself said that the householder called a servant and to one he gave five talents and to another he gave two talents and to another he gave one and everyone is to recognize the place he holds in the body in the body of christ if he has five talents apostle prophet evangelist pastor teacher five he has to operate and function in all those offices if he has only two is a pastor is a teacher he has to operate in those two if he has only two a pastor and an evangelist he has to operate in those two you check up you find out as god has given you calling and he makes you to be a minister or a member in the body of christ whatever gifts has given whatever office whatever function whatever ability whatever strength and whatever responsibility he has called you to you officiate in that responsibility and then on the day of judgment you'll be able to say i add five talents and now five are added i add two talents and now two are added and god will reward you will reward me reward us abundantly in jesus name let the church say amen. amen three things we're looking at in the message number one the limitless savior of the body we're talking about the body and then we're talking about how the body came together saved sanctified filled with the holy ghost and established upon the doctrine of christ and that body the church has the savior who is limitless the limitless savior of the body number two our loving service to the body our loving service to the body we don't serve with compulsion 
We don't serve with uh, grumbling. We don't serve with, I have to do this again. We don't serve with, uh, you know, it tires me. Okay, that's all I can do. That's all I can give. Uh, if that's okay for you, right? If it's not okay for you, then that's all I can do. But we come with love. We so love Christ and we love the body of Christ. And because of that, there is love, genuine love. And there is the death of love. And we come to serve with that love. Our loving service to the body. Number three, the lively synergy. That is, that's what synergy is about unity. It's about connecting together. It's about cooperation. It's about we're interwoven together and we're not in isolation. This one doing his own thing, that one doing his own thing, but a lively synergy in the body. Let's come to number one. Number one is the limitless Savior of the body. In Ephesians chapter 5, reading from verse 23. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. He is the Savior of the body. He raised up that body. He sacrificed for that body. He shed his blood for that body. And it is through that life that came through the blood of the Lamb that the body is alive and active. Otherwise, it will be a dead body. But Jesus Christ has saved the body. And now he continues to minister unto the body and the, and the ministry of the Savior to the body is limitless. Look at verse 24. In verse 24 it says, Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Verse 25, husbands love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. That's the ministry of the Savior, of the Lord, of Jesus Christ to the body. Look at verse 30. In verse 30, it tells us, For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. And then in verse 32, it says, it says, This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. The limitless savior of the body. Three things. Number one, the measure of his love for the body. The measure of his love for the body. You know, brothers and sisters, when we talk about love, we must have a point of reference. When we talk about the service of love, we must have a point of reference. The body the church. Christ the Savior. Christ the head. He ministers in love to that body. And that becomes a model, becomes a pattern, and becomes the yardstick by which you measure your love for the body. The measure of his love for the body. Number two, the marvel of his love for the believer. He loves every believer without any discrimination, without any partiality. The marvel of his love for the believer. Number three, the mandate, the command for our love for the beloved. The mandate of our love for the beloved. That's for Jesus Christ himself. If we love him, we love members of his body. Point number one there, the measure of his love for the body. In John chapter 15 verse 9, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. Look at the measure there. The Father loved him with undying love, 
unending love, continual love. He loves him with eternal love. And he says, you're asking the question, how do I love the body of Christ? How do I serve the body of Christ? Think about Christ and think about the Father. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. Look at verse 13. In verse 13, greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. That a man lay down his life for his friends. That means whatever I have to lay down to help the friends of Christ, the members of the body of Christ, the children of God, and the disciples of Christ to make them what they ought to be and to make them have the fullness of the provision of God for them. I have to lay that down. If he laid down his life for members of the body, can I lay down my time? Yes, if I'm following Christ. Can I lay down my conveniences? Yes, if I'm following Christ. Can I lay down my material things to take care of the members of the body of Christ? Yes, if I'm following Christ. Can I lay down the things that are precious to me, that I would rather have kept, I would rather have utilized for myself? Can I lay that down? Yes, if I love the members of the body of Christ. Think about yourself. Watch would you lay down to serve the body, to lift up the body, to heal the body, to support the body, to strengthen the body? Follow Christ because he laid down his very life for his friends, for you, for me, for us all, and for his friends in every generation. And so, Anywhere we find the real children of God, here is love, greater love, as no man than this, that a man should lead down his life for his friends. It tells us in Ephesians chapter 5, we're looking at verse 2. Ephesians chapter 5, we're looking at verse 2. And walk in love as Christ also has loved us. And walk in love as Christ also has loved us. You know Christ, how Christ loved us. There were times he had challenges and difficulties with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He never carried that on his face, on his shoulders, and say, I'm having difficulty. I'm having challenges. All these uh, people, they have come. And then he will gather the crowds together. And he'll be teaching them. And then the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they'll be there. And they will still teach the whole truth of the word of God. Because he loved the people. And he wanted them to know the truth. Whether the Pharisees were present or not, whether the gainsayers were present or not, that wasn't the problem. It's love for the people that they will have life and have life more abundantly made him to overlook whatever Pharisees or Sadducees were there and they will teach the whole counsel of God. And the Lord is telling us as ministers, as members that will walk in love as Christ also has loved us and has given himself has given himself that's the love of Christ he gave himself you know you can give a message without giving yourself you can give a service without giving yourself you protect your personality you protect your position, you protect your integrity, and you protect your status in life. You're still giving out something, but nothing must touch 
your dignity, your position, your highly exalted um, exaltation that you have, that's not Christ. Christ, Lord, and he gave himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for his sweet smelling savor. Let's now go to number two. Number two is telling us about the marvel of his love for the believer. The marvel of his love for the believer. It tells us in Galatians chapter 2, reading from verse 20, and it tells us here, it says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Christ liveth in me. You know, Christ left a part of himself in every believer. Exalted, honored by the Heavenly Father, and is seated on the right hand of majesty on high. Yet he gave part of himself, and Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Listen to this. Who loved me and gave himself for me. Who loved me. And as, a, as an evidence of that love for me, he gave himself for me. You know, there are people that talk about love, 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 love. I love you. I love you. And they cannot give themselves to anyone. They cannot give even a privilege, even an opportunity, even a position, even their own duty. If anybody comes near that, say, ah, that's my area. Don't touch that area. I love you. But once you come near my responsibility and my duty, that love will vanish away, evaporate away. Ah, what kind of love is that? He loved me and gave himself for me. The love we're talking about is the love that is able to see. That's my right. That's my opportunity. That's my responsibility. That's what I love. And I don't joke with that. And then we love a fellow brother. We love a fellow sister. And willingly, naturally, lovingly, we we'll say, my brother, I see the skill of God in your life. I see the ability of the Spirit, the power of the Holy Ghost in your life. I think you can do this better than I can. I'm voluntarily and sincerely and wholeheartedly. I give it. Come and do it. I know you can do it. Who loved me and gave himself for me. But the kind of love that never concedes anything to anyone, that never allows other people to touch anything because I am there and because I must be the one, the star, every time. That's not the love of Christ, the marvel of his love for the believer. Uh, look at um, uh, Titus chapter 2 verse 14 who gave himself for us, emphasizing that all the time, if we love, we will give. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. When you love, you give. Otherwise, that love is empty. Otherwise, that love is theoretical. Otherwise, that love is impotent. Otherwise, that love is dead. But who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. It tells us in Romans chapter 8 verse 37. Nay, in all these things were more than conquerors through him that loved us. He loved us 
and he did everything he ought to do to make us conquerors. If you love somebody, you'll not make him a failure. If you love somebody, you'll not make him a dumb match for us to wipe our feet on. If you love somebody, you will do everything while he's there. Everything while he's not there to make him a victor and to make him a conqueror. Everything you do, every action, if you love him, will be to lift him up, to encourage him, and to fire him on, so he will be a conqueror. But if you say you love somebody, and everything you always tell him will discourage him, will put him down, will make him uh, not want to get up to do anything if you will talk down at somebody so that he knows that he's a Mr. Nobody, a Mrs. Nobody, a brother, sister, nobody. That's not love. When you look down on people and when you trample on them and if they are trying to, you know, after this workers retreat, here is what I learned and here is how I prayed and this is what I'm going to do now. I'm going to climb every mountain. I'm going to go everywhere. I'm going to evangelize. And then you call him, come on here. Where are you coming from? Have you seen us in this district doing like that? Or well, hear that you, your day morning cry. I will hear that you are going to do evangelism. Don't you understand your position? Who gave you that permission? Now, if you are going to be a submissive member of this church, don't you ever do anything except we appoint for you to do it. Don't even clean the benches. And don't have any liberty to do anything except I tell you to do it. Uh-huh king authority that's all you can do where is the love if we love we encourage people jesus said go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature and they that was scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word men and women young and old and when we love you make them conquerors you give them tips, you give them understanding, and you give them liberty, and you give them something spiritual that will even make them to go beyond their original decision. My brother, my sister, that is love. It says, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us, the marvel of his love for the believer. Look at number three here. Number three, the mandate of our love for the beloved. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us. The challenges of the world don't constrain us. The discouragement of the world doesn't uh, constrain us. The comments of people, whether they downgrade us or they flatter us, that one does not constrain us. That one does not control us. But the love of Christ. I look at Calvary and I say, what can I do more? I look at him shedding his blood for me and for the rest of the world. And I say, how can I tell more of the people in the world? I look at him saying, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And I say, he forsook him because of the sins of the world and the sinners of the world, 50% of them have not heard. 80% of them have not heard. And that love of Christ, because of what Christ has done, the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. You die to criticism when you're moved by the love of God. You die to negative comments and negative actions when you are dead to like Christ. Because now, if you are not dead, every little comment they pass about you will make you sit down. 
any kind of evil eye that looks at you and they belittle you and they, they make you like a zero when you are excited you want to do something the way they look at you and the way they talk to you will just make all the fire to go down when you are not constrained by the love of christ but the love of christ constraineth us because we thus judge that if one died for all then were all all who believe in him they were all dead and then in verse 15 it says and that he died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves unto themselves you are not a sin i have to do this for myself first i have to get this honorable title for myself first I have to get this extra degree for myself first. I have to go to that overseas uh, trip first. Me first. My progress first. My exaltation first. And my promotion first. After that, if I have any scrap of time, if I have any redundant time that I can't make you up, all right, all right, I'll do some evangelism too. No, it says that is for that we should not live unto ourselves, but we live unto Him which died for them and rose again. And I pray that love of God will be implanted in every one of our hearts in Jesus' name. Maybe I should say the amen myself. Amen. God bless every one of you. We're looking at Matthew chapter 10. We're reading from verse 37. Matthew chapter 10, verse 37. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. It's talking about love. Uh, you, know, you know what he did? He left the glories of heaven. He left all the angels of heaven. He left the worship of the angels of heaven. And he came over here. And then he was walking about only with sandals. And then the people, they pushed him here and there. Sometimes tired, sometimes weary, sometimes, sometimes he's thirsty. And then he had to tell a woman, give me to drink. And that one will say, oh, you're asking me for a drink. You a Jew. Don't you know we never talk together? And he had to say, if you knew the person here talking to you, give me, telling you, give me a cup of water. You will leave everything and then you will ask him to give you the water of life. And they had no teaching still time. The disciples came back and they said, Eat, Master. I said, I have something to eat that you know not of. My meat is to do the will of Him that sent me and to finish His work. And you see, that's the way He loved us above Himself, above everything. That's why He said, Now, if you say you are my disciple, He that loveth Father, or mother more than me is not worthy of me and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me oh you say i love jesus my jesus my savior my lord my king my shepherd i will never love any son any daughter more than my lord jesus christ that's talk of the mouth as your child is overseas and then she requires school fees, he requires school fees, you will sell whatever you want to sell to make sure that that school fees gets to that child in good time. And once the child sends home and makes just a single request, and he says all this and it runs into millions you run here and there you borrow and you get to the bank and they give you loan and you send immediately uh-huh but now the church of god they are worshiping almost in the rain 
and the body of Christ is there and they are making announcements in the local church we need this, we need this, we need this so that during this rainy season we'll have a shelter on earth and we'll worship the Lord. We don't know when the Lord will come. We don't want anybody to, you know, leave because things are not all right. We're all here and then we pray. But what we did for our son, what we did for our daughter, running everywhere and sucking everywhere to get money and send to him, to her, we cannot do that for the church, for the body of Christ. And Jesus said, he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He's given us a mandate. Lovest thou me more than these? Yes, Lord, feed my lambs. Peter, Simon Peter, lovest thou me? Yes, Lord, you know I do. You know all things. If you love me, if you love me, if you love me, go feed my sheep. And that's what the Lord is telling us. It's our response to the mandate of love for the beloved. We we'll come to point number two. In point number two, our loving service for the body, for the body our loving service for the body already we've read in um, romans chapter 12 verse 4 for as we have many members in one body and all the members all members have not the same office it says in verse 5 so we be many are one body in christ so we be many are one body in christ and every one members one of another and look at verse 9 there in verse 9 it says let love be without dissimulation let love be without pretense let love be without hypocrisy and for that which is evil cling to that which is good and then in verse 10 be kindly affectioned one to another be kindly affectioned one to another be kindly affectioned one to another in brotherly love not worldly love in brotherly love not historical love not literature book work what we reach in literature books magazines not a kind of love and it is not an erotic love a fleshly love be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love in honor tell me what follows tell me tell me out aloud preferring one another do you know so-called Christians they don't respect anyone but themselves no matter who you are they just walk independent of the whole church independent of all the members independent of any member of the church and they have this a traditional attitude of not respecting anyone and the bible says the word of god says if the love is not artificial if the love is not theoretical if the love is not tribal love tribal that's a person of a particular tribe no matter he may not even have a bicycle to ride he may not have a house of himself to live in in the in the tribe they just carry themselves with pride and they, they don't respect anybody that's not christianity if we're acting like that and we never respect and we don't prefer other people above us whatever other people do whatever they achieve whoever they are and whatever 
privilege they may have in life we just say that same is he feeding me is he giving me this and then when it comes to women you'll be surprised there are people that do not feel that women have any say or they have any quality or they have anything to make them respect them and accept their place and position in the church but the lord is saying all that is tribal all that is human all that does not show that we have the love of christ in us it says be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor preferring one another i pray we'll have the real grace of god i said we'll have the grace of god I will have the transformation and the change that the grace of God brings into every life of every believer in Jesus' name. Amen. Three things we're looking at here. Number one, the pattern of love among believers. Number two, the practice of love within the body. Number three, the priority of love for his book. The priority of love for his book. We're coming to number one. Number one, the pattern of love among believers believers look at john chapter 13 we're looking at verse 34 john chapter 13 verse 34 a new commandment i give unto you you know when you come into the kingdom of god when you are born again when you just came the lord gives you a new commandment everybody has been talking about love when you're a little child Daddy, do you really love me? Am I your child? Mommy, do you really love me? Am I your child? We've been talking about love. And then when we go to school, that teacher doesn't love me. And therefore, I don't understand a subject. And when we come, we start in the place of work. We say, those workers, they don't love me. They don't accept me. We've been talking about love. And yet, when we come into the kingdom of God, something different, something new. It says, a new commandment I give unto you. And before you came here today, I'm sure you've heard about love, the love of Christ in our hearts. And the love we ought to manifest one to the other. Lift up those who are discouraged. Encourage those who are downtrodden. And help those who are feeble-minded. And don't uh, pounce on them. Uh, and don't crush them. Uh, I'm sure we've heard. But now the Lord is saying, beyond what you have done before, with beyond what you have been before, a new commandment I give unto you that she love one another as I, as I, as Christ has loved you, that she also love one another. Do you ever evaluate your action on the basis of love? Do you ever evaluate your utterances on the basis of love? Do you ever evaluate your service on the basis of love? All the services, everything you do. Do you ever evaluate your ministry on the basis of love? Or you evaluate yourself only on keeping to the doctrine? You evaluate yourself on being on time. You evaluate yourself on uh, this is my duty and I've done it with all the skill I have. How about the motive behind the action? How about the love behind the action? 
How about the attitude behind the action? You see, that's what the Lord is looking for. He says that she love one another as I have loved you, that she also love one another. And then in verse 35, by this shall all men know that she are my disciples. By this shall all in heaven, all on earth, know that she are my disciples. We might have a high sounding testimony. I am, I am, I am. I got saved, 19 such and such. And I've been in the church. I've never deviated. I've always been in this church. By that, heaven and earth will not reckon that you are a child of God. If you are in the church, you've never missed any service. And you've never missed any opportunity to serve. About the anger, about the hatred, about the bad character, about the animosity, about the criticisms, about the humiliation you give to other people, about stamping down other people. Where is the Lord? He's telling us, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. I pray we'll have love one to another. Look at First Thessalonians chapter 4, and I'm reading from verse 9. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 9, But as touching brotherly love, sisterly love, membership love, as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God. Ye yourselves are taught of God. It's one thing to listen to the preacher. It's one thing to read the Bible. It's another thing after reading the Bible to then close your eyes and talk to the Father and say, Father, I've read about love today. And they forgot to talk to you, taught by God. How to love your wife. How to love your husband, how to love your children, how to love anyone, everyone around you. It's one thing to read, it's one thing to hear, it's another thing for you to be open to the revelation of God. How to love one another. It says, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love another. When last did God speak to you? You're saved, you're sanctified, you're filled with the Holy Ghost. When last did God tell you, my son, my daughter, that attitude you manifested to that person, you know he's discouraged, you know he's not happy. Did you see how he dropped his shoulders and his hands and he walked out and he walked away from you like a nobody? What are you going to do? And God is talking to you now. Why don't you get to him, my brother? I don't know why I spoke like that. Manifest love. Wake up love. The love that should be in your heart. If God is talking to you. But if we just, um, you know, go around life, we never hear God. God is not talking to us. And God is not teaching us. We push that one down. I we don't feel anything. He's old enough to be strong. If I push him, he should take his stand. And then we trample on the other one. And one will, then we we'll say, if he's a Christian, he should not complain. We we'll just had that in the last Bible study, in the last service. No grumbling, no complaining. And so whatever I do to him, why should he complain? If that is the way we're living our lives. And the Lord is not talking to us and is not teaching us how to love there is something missing in your communication with God but as touching brotherly love ye need not that I write unto you for ye yourselves are taught of 
God to love one another. Look at verse 10. In verse 10, and indeed ye do it toward all the brethren. Ye do it toward all the brethren. Whether the brethren are from the north, from the south, from the east, or from the west, you love and you do it towards all the brethren. You are not seen. What are you doing here? This is our home. This is our place. Go to your own place. We have our own place here, so you go to your own place too. Now, when believers are talking like that, and then they see a leader, a leader who has come from another place, what are you doing here? Don't you have your own place? This is our own place. In fact, we have so many workers here, we don't have enough people, we don't have enough position for them. And you have come here. What are you coming to do? When we talk like that, when we think like that, we do not have the love that we're talking about. Indeed, you do it toward all the brethren which are in Macedonia. But we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more. We will increase. I will increase. Now, if you don't evaluate where you are, how can you increase? If you don't judge yourself and judge your action and examine your love, how will you increase? If you do not know at what level you are now, how will you then increase? It means when we hear the word of God, we will match that word of God with ourselves. What's my level of love in my family? What's my level of love to the workers? What's my level of love to all the brethren? What's my level of love to believers from another tribe? And it's when we understand where we are, then we will increase more and more. We will increase in Jesus' name. Look at number two here. Number two is talking about the practice of love within the body. It's not something we just talk about. We practice it. We do it. You will do it in Jesus' name. And every time they say practice, practice, practice makes perfection. As you practice it today, it's not completed. You practice it again, and then you practice it again. Perfect love will come through every one of us in Jesus' name. First Peter chapter 1, verse 22. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren if the adamic nature is deeply rooted in us we cannot practice this unfeigned love if traditional values are entrenched in us we cannot practice this unfeigned love if habitual attitude habitual action that's the way i am that's the way i've always been and grace has come in and grace does not change what you have always been on faith love cannot come but seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit the holy ghost must get involved on to unveil love see of the brethren see that she love one another with a pure heart tell me the word that follows that heart fervently fervently you'll be excited about loving the brethren you'll be happy about loving the brethren and let me remind you when you are you know just discover the will of god as a man this is the one you are going to get married to. And then you just met, and people don't know. And you met each other on the way, and already you know that's the will of God. And you've done an introduction, but people don't know. And then you, are, you met on the side of the road. You're so excited, and then you greeted her, and she greeted you. And then somebody uh, passing by looked like that, and he looked at you from head to toe as if you are you know smaller than who you are 
you don't mind you don't mind you just carry on because the love you have for her overshadowed all the things that she he may be thinking about you see the same thing when you love the children of God and you love the Lord and you are doing what you're doing because of the love of God somebody can pass on and go around and look at you like this I say if you are a nobody but heaven knows you are somebody I said heaven knows that you are somebody and with that attitude you don't mind what people think and what people say and people may even mock you and people may jest about you but your heart is purified and your heart loves the other person and loves the members of the church with unfeigned love of the brethren and you love with a pure heart fervently i pray that love the lord will implant in every one of our hearts in jesus name when other people suffer you take care of them when other people have peculiar needs you go there we don't have to push you don't have to even make announcement and somebody doesn't have to send you the love is flowing from your heart and it is fervent and no need and no lack will pass your understanding or your view will take care of each other unselfishly in Jesus name look at number three here number three is talking about the priority of love for his book the Word of God almost love that book you know it's it's this book the Bible that shows us how to love God how God loves us how Jesus loves us I want to love Jesus in return is this book that shows us I want to love the brethren I want to love sinners I want to love enemies is this book that shows us how to love spiritual things and how that love eventually will carry us from earth and carry us to heaven we need to love the book because it's the book that shows us what love is and how to receive love and how to give love. Look at Psalm 119. In Psalm 119, we're reading from verse 97. Psalm 119, verse 97. Oh, how I love thy Lord thy book it is my meditation all the day long in verse 98 it says thou through thy commandments in the book has made me wiser than mine enemies for they are ever with me in, in verse 99 I have more understanding than all my teachers for thy testimonies are my meditation look at 100 it says I understand more than the ancients because I keep thy precepts verse 113 in verse 113 I hate winters and I but I love but I love do I love and in verse 163 it says I hate and abort lying but thy law do I love verse 165 it says great peace of day that love thy law and nothing shall offend them it says they so love the word of God gone what it is when we're coming to church that you wrap your Bible because you don't want anybody in the community to know you wrap your Bible in newspaper and somebody says where are you going I am going there where is the there you are going to church and which kind of church which church are you going to my brother there my sister there which church are you going to we say it with love and we say it with joy with excitement we love the church we love the body of Christ and we love the book we love the Bible and we're not sneaking out to read the Bible everybody around knows that we are men and women of the book and we love that book and we're not offended when anybody passes any comment yeah the freedom of speech I have the freedom of worship and you keep on worshiping the Lord in Jesus name Hebrews chapter 10 verse 7 Hebrews chapter 10 we're reading from verse 7 then said I lo 
I come in the volume of the book, it is reaching of me to do thy will, O God. We take that book and then we see the promises reaching of me, the precepts reaching of me, the, pro the prophecies reaching of me, the commandments reaching of me, and we love it, we enjoy it, and it is our meat and drink all the day long. In verse 16, it tells us in verse 16, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws and leave them from the book. I'll put those laws in their hearts and in their minds will I write them. And when the Lord has written his word, his law of love, his word of love in your heart, and then he shows you by what he has written in your heart, you will love everyone. If you are likely to forget, your mind will come up. You'll be reminded. And your heart will come up, stir you up. You're reminded because the book is transferred into your very heart. I pray that this love, loving service to the body of Christ and to everyone without discrimination, without exception, the Lord will fulfill in every life in Jesus' name. Let's come to number three now. Number three is the lively synergy in the body. The lively synergy, connection, togetherness, and cooperation in the body of Christ. Uh, look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 14. For the body is not one member, but many. In verse 15, it tells us, it says, If the foot shall say, because I'm not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? Of course you know, the hand can never tell the feet, and the feet will never tell the hand that, you know, you are not important. All the members accept each other. And these, think about it, look at your two hands. Those two hands are being together now for 40, 50, 70, 80 years. And none of the fingers said, I'm tired of my position here. I'm tired of being this all the time. Look at your two feet there. The feet have not said, after all these years, can't we change roles? After all these years, do I have to be the one in contact with the dirty, muddy ground? And all these years, the ears have not complained, and the mouth has not complained, and the eyes have not complained. After all these many years, the heart pumping the blood all through your veins, they have not complained. That's what the Lord is saying, that as we are together, we're just happy and satisfied with wherever we are and whatever we're doing to move the body forward. It says in verse 18, look at that verse 18, it says, but now as God said, the members, every one of them in the body, as it has pleased him, not as it has pleased them. The, you know, we were born into this world, and the hands just see that their hands. And the feet see that their feet. And the eyes see that their eyes. As it has pleased him. There's no campaign. There's no politics. There's no rioting. There's no protest. Get me out of here. Get me out of here. I want to be. I want to be. The Lord has said the members, every one of them in the body, as it has pleased him. I pray that what pleases the Father will please you. What pleases the Lord will please you. And anywhere you are, and whatever is giving you to do, say, praise the Lord. This is what pleases the Father and it pleases me. Three things we're looking at. Number one is prayer for unity and oneness in the body. Number two, the progress through unity and oneness of all believers. 
Number three, the power of unity and oneness among builders. Number one, number one is prayer for unity and oneness in the body. Look at John chapter 17, verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Look at verse 20. In verse 20, it says, Neither pray I for this alone, that they shall be sanctified, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Why that prayer? What's the basis for that prayer? What's the reason for that prayer? Verse 21, that they all may be one. Unity and oneness. That they all may be one unity and oneness have you found people who are loud about sanctification praise the lord i'm sanctified what you understand by that is i'm not chewing this i'm not drinking this i'm not wearing this i'm not going here i bow the anger praise the lord i'm sanctified about the competition canal worldly competition praise god i'm sanctified i about the disunity always seeing the opposite of what your brother sees praise god i'm sanctified follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the lord is talking to those other people is talking to those other people how about you are you at peace are you serene are you comfortable are you all right whatever that brother is doing whatever that sister is doing are you always finding one doctrine that will oppose that sister doing what she's doing what's the state of your heart when we're sanctified the purpose of the prayer of the lord jesus christ is that they all may be one as thou father art in me and i in thee the unity and the oneness as thou father art in me and i in thee the father never has anything in the heart against the son and the son is not begrudging the heavenly father because of this and this he sent me here to suffer all this and then i must drink this cup what kind of father is this he's left me all alone to suffer never as thou father art in me and i in thee that's what jesus prayed for then he says that they also may be one in us one not outside us when you are one in christ you cannot just say anything do anything act anyhow as if you are a man outside Christ, as if you are a woman outside Christ, all your actions, all your disposition, all your behavior, all your thinking, all your attitude is managed by the fact that you are in the Father and you are in the Son. It says that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. What does that mean? Let's say, for example, your relatives who are not born again, they come to your family. The way you behave to each other, husband and wife, and the way the children react to whatever the parents are saying, it's not different from their, the situation in their unbelieving family. How will they say, because of what I see here, not even listening to preaching what i see here the unity and the oneness and the togetherness and the cooperation and the love i want to have what they have it says i'm praying that they'll be sanctified and they'll be one as our father art in me and i in thee that they may all be one in us in the father and the son that the world may believe that thou has sent me 
I pray it shall be so in every one of our lives in Jesus name look at number two here number two is the progress through unity and oneness of all believers of of all believers look at genesis chapter 11 we're reading from verse 6 genesis 11 reading from verse 6 it says and the lord said behold the people is one the people they are so bound together they're so united together and there's synergy among them it's like instead of saying the people are one the multitude are one it says the people is one and they have all one language and this they begin to do and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do those who are even unbelievers but because they were so united the unity god said that this thing they want to do because they are so united nothing will be restrained from them and when you come to the new testament that's why there was progress in the new testament acts of the apostles chapter 4 verse 32 acts chapter 4 verse 32 it says and the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul the multitude remember 120 people remember 3,000 people remember 5,000 people and then when you add them all together there were already more than 8,000 and the Lord added to the church every day such as should be saved they were in their thousands and all of them that believed they were of one heart and they were of one soul to start with among the leadership the apostles all of one heart can you imagine 12 apostles in the same central church apostles the 12 of them all the 12 being in one place one heart and whoever is to preach today go ahead and peter rises up go ahead and peter preaches again go ahead hey peter the 12 of us here and you are the one always always say something we're all saved peter remember that we're all sanctified peter remember that we're all baptized in the holy ghost peter remember that we all have the fire i will have the word remember that we all have the power to be a witness remember that peter why are you always talking no disagreement at all can we have 12 state overseers in one central church at a state capital all the 12 in one place what kind of thing is this it's just to show whether we can be of one heart and one soul and be together can we have all the men all the women and mary the mother of jesus was there and we didn't hear of any disagreement and the mother of jesus calling any of those preachers come jesus was my son and all that you are doing now, an angel appeared to me before you even became born again. So pedal down, so pedal, and listen to me, and give me my position. Nothing like that. I pray this kind of unity and oneness the Lord will give a church in Jesus' name will not be grudging anybody or criticizing anybody uh, two overseers i want state three overseers i want say 12 overseers i want church what kind of thing is this now okay we're going to see where this is leading to they were all in one accord in one place the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul neither said any of them that all of the things which they possess was his own but the art tell me tell me out aloud all things come on look at verse 33 it says and with great power gave the apostles all of them 
They didn't mind. They were in the same place with great power. Gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. Our time has come. I said our time has come. Look at number three here. Number three, we're looking at the power of unity and oneness among the builders. As we're building together and then we're united like at the time of Nehemiah, they were all united and Shabbalat and Tobay or, or whatever their name, Tobiah, they were not able to stop the work. All the Shambalats and all the Tobias anywhere will not be able to stop this mighty force of God in Jesus name and look at uh, look at this in a uh, first Corinthians chapter 3 and I'm reading from verse 10 first Corinthians chapter 3 we're looking at verse 10 uh, according to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder I have laid the foundation and another build it thereupon but let every man that's you that's me that's us together let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. You come, contribute your part. She comes, contributes her part. We all come and contribute our part. And there is unity. And this body of Christ will go places and we will circle the land, saturate the land. And the work of God will prosper in our hands in Jesus' name. Let's forget the past and let's rise up in new strength, in new power, with new vision, with new unity, and with new oneness. And we push everything behind us, whatever will bring disunity, whatever will bring criticism, whatever will bring memory, whatever will bring uh, any division, we, we put that under our feet, we're going to be a mighty army. I said we'll be a mighty army. Are you part of that mighty army? Where are you? Why don't you stand up and say, Lord, here am I. I'll be a part of this mighty army. And we're going to march on and we're going to move forward. And this work of the Lord will, be, will prosper in every one of our hands, in our hands together. In Jesus' name, open your mouth and tell the Lord what you want to be from now on in unity with the whole church, in unity with the Lord.